greetings again in Jesus' name. You know, the fundamental principle of coming to a, a real redemption, salvation and redemption, has been presented to us in the first couple of chapters of the Bible in doing well. That man is given the God-given ability to come to God on his terms, on God's terms, and perform the deeds necessary to be acceptable unto God, whether that be the deeds worthy of repentance or the sacrifices that like Cain and Abel presented there in Genesis chapter 4. <clears throat> See, the difference there between Cain and Abel, when God spoke to Cain after his, his, uh, his sacrifice was not accepted, and he told him, you know, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and its desire for, is for you, but you should rule over it. Now, why would he have told him that if he was unable to rule over it? If all this stuff about faith alone and no effort and not a works and God accepts you as filthy rags and the worst sin of all is for you to make any effort, why would he have told him to make the effort? If Christ was slain from the foundation of the world, it, d doesn't that apply from Genesis to Revelation? Well, I must think most certainly that it does. There's not a before and after. There's either looking forward to the cross or back to the cross in our case. But it all stems upon what Christ did to redeem man from the corrupting influence of sin. So the corrupting influence of sin was about to overtake this man. It wasn't that he was born in sin. He didn't have a sin nature. Otherwise, God wouldn't have told him to do well. So the difference between him and Abel, which it says of Abel in, in Hebrews 11.4, that Abel offered God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, by which he attained witness that he was righteous. Why? Because he did what was right. See, he did what was right, just like the Scripture said, he who does what is right is righteous. Your first act of faith towards God is obedience from your heart. That obedience would be manifested in producing deeds worthy of repentance. The biggest curse in Christianity and Christendom for all time is that you can be saved in your sin by faith alone, some nebulous idea that somehow God's going to do it all for you. That's the biggest curse that's ever come upon mankind. Romans chapter 4 doesn't teach exclusively that you're justified in your sins and the ungodly. Do you think you remain ungodly? Did David remain ungodly? Did Abraham remain ungodly? No. They manifested an obedient heart towards God in a pattern of good works. In their, in, in their faith, the steps of Abraham, the deeds of Abraham, the faithfulness of a man whose heart is empty of guile as David stated in his Psalms. But nevertheless, the, back to Cain and Abel, what was the difference? Well, the difference was fundamentally the same principle in all the parables between the sheep and the goats. You know, those that are going to enter or those that are not going to enter. The wheat and the tares. The foolish or the wise virgins. The faithful and the unfaithful servant. The same principle applies. One did well and one did not do well. And the same thing, didn't Jesus say? Those wicked and lazy servants be cast into the outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then he says, Thou good and faithful servant, enter into thy rest. What about the sheep and the goats? What was the difference between the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25? What the sheep did and what the goats didn't do. The same thing between Cain and Abel. What Abel did, and a more acceptable sacrifice, and what Cain didn't do. And then succumb to his sin, like James chapter 1 talks about. Sin takes captive. See, it gave birth. Sin gave birth. He was drawn away and enticed by his own lust, lustful desires, and then that took him captive, and then he went out and slayed his brother. And why did he slay his brother? Well, just like the Scripture says, because his brother's deeds were righteous and his wicked. So it's always a contrast between the deeds worthy, the righteous, and the wicked in the Scriptures. And God always calling upon man to do his part, to come, let us reason together, to come and draw near to me, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Come, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. It's always God calling upon man, telling him that each is given according to his ability to produce an increase. God expects an increase of his grace. Yes, he forgives our past sins freely, the free gift of grace, the, the remission of past sins by the blood of Christ. 
But that doesn't exempt us from faithfulness and endurance to the end that determines the outcome of salvation. See, that's the biggest deception among the professed out there today, that they don't understand or they fail to recognize that it's patient continuance in doing good that is the determining factor of whether or not they're going to enter the kingdom. See, they think salvation is a package deal determined upon Christ's finished work and not anything that they do in the process of repentance. So whether or not they enter the kingdom of God is already secured in their trust or their faith alone, even though they produce filthy rags in their life. So well-doing, even as a byproduct of faith, is never a necessity because not doing well won't disqualify them from the kingdom. <clears throat> but it surely did with Cain. It surely did with the sheep and the goats. It surely did with the wheat and the tares, the foolish and the wise virgins, virgins, the faithful and the unfaithful servant. We see that in Jesus' teaching. Well, if you want a theology, then what about Jesus' teaching? He didn't teach theology. He says, my doctrine. And doctrine just means his teaching. So, but see the plastic world of delusion that these people are in. Well, Christ ruled over it for me. See, he told Cain to rule over it. He had to rule over it, but I don't have to. Well, what, what makes you think you don't have to? You're a slave to whom you obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. So who's your master? Again, like we, talk, we talked about in perfecting sin. You're either doing the works of iniquity or you're doing the works of righteousness in your life. There's no escaping the consequences. <clears throat> you reap what you sow like Galatians 6 talks about. Then he goes on to say, Don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due season ye shall reap if you faint not. In other words, if you don't give up. So again, beseeching you to understand that the purpose of Christ and the grace and faith, the cross, is to redeem you from the corrupting influence of sin make you a vessel fit for the master's use, purged by the blood so that you're ready for present service. That's the grace of God that's appeared to all men, to teach you to deny ungodliness, worldly lusts, to live soberly, righteously in this present age. Now, if you can't be done by the grace of God through the Spirit of God dwelling in you, victory over sin, the flesh, and the devil, no temptation befallen anyone that's common to man, that with that temptation he give you a way of escape, and then still the excuse, the excuse that you're going to fail every day, that you're going to return to your vomit, that you're going to sin all the time. You see how foolish that is to say that you're unable. You know, in Matthew chapter 20, we see him talking to his disciples about the cup that he was about to drink. You know, they like to talk about the cup of wrath, but this was the cup of the suffering that he would endure on the cross in, the chapter, in Matthew 20. And then, they, and then he talked about if they were, if his disciples are able. He says, are, are, do you, are you able to do this? And they said, yeah, we are able. They didn't make an excuse. Oh, I, no, I'm the chief of sinners. Oh, my righteousness, filthy rags, Lord. I, I'm not able to do such a thing. You'll have to do it for me. See, if that was the case, if that was the theology that was going to be handed down to Paul in, Ro in Romans and Corinthians and all his epistles, then why wasn't it made plain here? Because he was about to be baptized in the baptism of death on the cross and asked them if they could do the same, if they could also put to death that, that old man of sin, if they could also endure that kind of suffering and say, yes, we are able. They didn't make any excuse. You see what I mean? And neither, neither, did, neither did Cain or Abel. They just did one what willing to live into, go into sin. And Abel, of course, offering a more acceptable sacrifice unto God. He says, what, and what's he say after that? He says, yeah, you will indeed. You will indeed experience this suffering. You will indeed follow in my footsteps. Just like Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 in his epistle in 21 through 24. This is the example that we follow in his footsteps. Well, what's he mean? To die to sin and live for righteousness, he goes on to say in verse 24. That's what, after he outlined what Christ did. 
That's the example because you are able, you have the ability to act upon these things if you've come into Christ. See, your first act, of course, is obedience from your heart. Like Romans 6, 16, you obeyed from your heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Having been set free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. See, the first doing well that there is, is coming clean with God. If that's not doing well, I don't know what is. And if you're not able to do that, well, then how can there be a, anyone have a good and honest heart where the seed can fall into and take root? See, it's impossible. See, the seed took root in the good and honest heart and then brought forth an increase. Well, what was that good and honest heart? A heart that was prepared to receive it. The preparation of the heart being of man, being within the ability of man to do so. <clears throat> to prepare your heart as a living sacrifice unto God. See, when you realize that you're able to repent, you're able to obey God, you're able to come clean, well then that's when the process will begin. That's when the godly sorrow will begin. That's when the season of contriteness and brokenness will start in your life. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. From what I've seen, people under so much delusion and so much sin and so much error and lies that they've been told for so long, it takes a while to come out of that before they can find a final redemption in that refreshing of spirit that takes place, that miracle of the new birth. Because they have to become a vessel fit for the master's use. That takes place in repentance through you working together with God and the spirit of course, is they're convicting.